Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here with you today on a, on a Saturday. Thankfully, not a sunny Saturday. <laughs> and um, I, I have a real privilege of being able to talk about something that I think is not controversial at all. And as a public health physician, this is really the focus of the work that, that we do and what we want to um, emphasize from a public health perspective, and that is prevention. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we've come up with the risk assessment in DC and some of the work that we've done around raising awareness about Lyme disease and about ticks in general, and uh, hopefully show you a little video at the end that will um, show you some of the work that we've been doing. I first off want to say that I work at the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control and I'm also uh, on faculty at UBC, at the School of Population and Public Health. But I have no, um, uh, in terms of disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest. I don't receive money from any <laughs> drug company or any, any uh, manufacturer related to Lyme disease. So just make that clear. So the background, Lyme disease in BC has been around for quite some time. This is from 1993. And it actually has been a reportable communicable disease in British Columbia since that time. So um, uh, our in introduction mentioned that um, it's become a national notifiable disease, but that is a voluntary thing. But it has been reportable for quite a long time in British Columbia. And we've been monitoring um, the ticks that, that, have, that we have in BC and Lyme disease for quite some time. So the vector in BC is quite different than the vector in other parts of Canada. And I think that's something that's really important. And when we hear from some of our colleagues later on today who've done some work around climate change, for example, most of that is work done with Exotis scapularis, which is the tick that's found in the eastern part, the other side of the Rockies and uh, eastern Canada. So we have Exotis pacificus here in BC, and it is the main vector of Lyme disease. We also have uh, more rarely found ticks that are probably vectors of Lyme disease, Exotis angustus in Oritulis, <laughs> and I can never pronounce that quite right. And we have found those a, a little bit in BC, but they're much lower levels. The infectivity level is low, and we'll do some, uh, I'll show you some of the work that we've done looking at that. One of the other things I think is important in BC is the most common tick that people are exposed to is Dermacentra antisoni, which is the dog tick. And that's the one that we see a lot of in BC. And thankfully, it is not a vector for Lyme disease, although it is a vector for some other things. So I think um, tick awareness in general is something we've been trying to promote. We have had case definitions for Lyme disease for a long time, and I'm not going to talk about it too much, other than to say that clinical diagnosis of erythema migrans is reportable in BC. And we don't get a lot of reports of just the clinical diagnosis of Lyme, um, but we do get some, and it helps us monitor um, what's happening in the community. We also um, have uh, laboratory confirmed diagnoses are also reportable in BC. And just so you know, it's complex, and I think we'll hear more about this. You know, how to diagnose Lyme disease, what signs and symptoms it has, and the testing for it. And that's for others to talk about later today. Some of the work that um, has been done, the early work that was done, by, mostly by my colleague, uh, Mohamed Morshen, and his predecessor, Dr. Banerjee, at the BC CDC lab, in the early 90s, we tried to get a sense of, you know, where was this tip? How much of it was carrying Borrelia? And what was the risk? So this is some of the um, results from the early testing done, looking at ticks and mice and the positivity rates for Lyme disease. And as you can see, the positivity rates are actually quite low. Um, we were able to continue that later in the 90s and up to 2007. And again, every year, we try and, and culture um, ticks and We've um, done serology work and culture on mice, and have found, again, consistently a very low um, positivity rate. Certainly is there, though. The other thing that uh, we've done, um, and then again, mostly this is in Morshad's lab, is look at the ticks that we receive. So a lot of the, the work that we do in the, the BCCDC in the public health lab is looking at um, the risk of Lyme disease, and we follow the number of tests that are ordered for Lyme disease, and there's about uh, 2,500 that are ordered every year, and that's been relatively consistent over the last 15 years. We haven't seen a dramatic increase in people who are being tested for Lyme. Um, the actual positivity rate is considerably lower. The other thing that we do is we receive ticks. Um, mostly we like to see ticks that are off people, but we also receive ticks that are submitted um, from animals, and we know that um, dogs in particular, people, their dogs are out in the grassy areas, and uh, people often find ticks on their dogs. 
So this is just a, a schematic that shows some of the last number of years, the numbers of ticks that we've received in the lab. And it's about, again, about 1,500 a year. Most of them are other things, but we also test the exotic specifics. Um, and finally, this is just a, another um, looking at serology tests on deer mice to try and get a sense of are they a common um, vector for Lyme disease. And again, the serology shows that it's pretty much um, a low rate of positivity. So the risk areas that we came up with based on a whole lot of data that was collected in the, in mostly through the 90s shows that, that in BC, the risk areas for Lyme disease for these ticks is actually in the lower mainland in particular, in southern Vancouver Island. So for, for us, it's interesting because these are the populated areas of BC, as we know. So actually, staying in the city is not exactly a, a protective thing. And one of the areas that we've seen high rates of, of uh, um, exotic specificus is around the Burnaby Mountain, for example, of Simon Fraser University. So we've known for some time that uh, the ticks are established in areas where there is human interaction in that interface. So we've, uh, our messaging has been targeted around people, even if you live in the city, if you're in that grassy interface areas, those are your risk areas for, for this. So one of the things that we did using this data from, that we had from the 90s and into the 2000s, we wanted to get a, an assessment of you know, where are the areas that we're likely to find these ticks, and where are the areas that are more likely to have um, Borrelia positive ticks, and so that we could more be more systematic in how we go out and explore the environment to see what the risk might be. So we've done what we call ecological niche modeling, and this is work um, that Morshed, myself, and our, our colleague geographer <coughs> Sunny Mack um, did a lot of work on in the last couple of years. And what what this looks at is the relationship between um, the epidemiology, the ticks, the habitat that we have, and the climate that supports the tick habitat. And what we're looking for is, where is the ecological niche? Where are the places that we're more likely to find this um, tick in BC and that where the, the conditions are suitable for it? So most people um, who know Lyme disease know that um, the tick, uh, the exotic tick likes to live in grassy, bushy areas. So not dense forest and not grass plains. So this is some, I'm going to show you some maps that we came up with using the geographic distribution of the exotic specificus um, that we found in the, from the early 90s until the mid 2000s. And this is uh, the distribution of, of exotic ticks that we found. And interestingly, um, as far north as Fort St. John. This is the exotic angustus, again, found in many places around the province. Um, but if we look at the, the distribution of the Borrelia positive ticks, so where we found actually ticks that do have Borrelia, it's much more limited to mostly the, the more populated areas of the southern, um, um, southern BC. So with this modeling that we looked at, we looked at where are the areas in BC that we would more likely find ticks, and so that we could go out, the data that we had was based on, on some sampling in the field, but also from things that people were sent in to us. And what we wanted to do was be more strategic and look at that in a little bit more um, scientific manner. So this is, the forecast of ecological niche for exotic specificus in British Columbia based on tick samples, the data that we had, but also the, the types of environment and the, the types of um, ecology uh, that might support ticks. And surprising to us, Hyde of Wild actually turned out to be an area um, that would, that we, if you look at the habitat, we would project would support exotic specificus. And so we actually went up there and tested and did some field testing and found, yes, we did have Exotis specificus up there. Interestingly though, um, and this is Exotis angustus, and as you can see, there's a lot of overlap in the, the ecological niche for both of these ticks. The other thing that we looked at was, okay, there's the ecological niche for the tick, but there's also um, areas that are better suited for ticks to be infected with Borrelia. And that decreases the area quite, a, quite substantially that um, we would expect to find Borrelia positive ticks. And again, this is based on this, this modeling that we've done. So, and we've done some field testing that has confirmed this. So we went up to Haida Gwaii, we found ticks, we tested them, and uh, none of them were positive for Borrelia. I mean, that was only a, over two seasons, so it was a relatively short period of time. 
but it did sort of validate the fact that these models have some some value. So what we've uh, what we're we, uh, we ran out of funding in 2008, so we haven't been able to do a whole lot with it for a while. But what did this tell us? This told us that there's a very clear risk of Lyme disease in BC. And that risk is probably low, but we needed to make sure that people were aware of it and knew what to do about it. Um, laboratory tests need to be taken in the context of this low risk, um, and I think that we'll, people will talk about that later. <coughs> And we really want to continue with monitoring of our trends and our geographic distribution because that helps us really understand, you know, there's areas of risk so that we can better target our prevention messages. Thankfully, we've uh, now received some more funding. So starting this year, we're going to be going again and systematically sampling in those areas where we expect to find ticks and where we would expect to find Borrelia to see if we can validate our results some more. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in looking at is, you know, with the, the changing um, spread of or urban spread into certain areas, it, does that mean there'll be more or less interface with ticks? And I think of Burnaby Mountain and all of the construction that's been going on around that area, you know, a lot of the tick habitat has actually been removed. So we're really interested in seeing whether we find ticks there anymore. So this is, uh, so this is kind of exciting for us and we're looking forward to that happening, but really, the bottom line for us is we need to more effectively target our prevention messages because we don't want people to get Lyme disease in the first place. We don't want them to be bitten by ticks. So prevention to us is key. And we've done a number of things to try and um, spread the word about ticks, about Lyme disease, about risk. And we've got that brochures like these ones that we um, put out in all the parks across the province. Um, we specifically target the areas where we, we know we have concern about, about Lyme disease. We, um, a number of messages that we put out every year when uh, the ticks are, are becoming more active and this is something we go out to community groups. We try and encourage people to be aware of the risk and to take precautions. The other thing that we've done, which is a, a really neat project, and I'm going to show you this, is we've partnered with some of our colleagues up at UBC, Karen Bartlett and uh, Anne-Marie Nichol, and we've tried to put together some messaging, especially for young people, around tick awareness so that we can um, increase our prevention messages. And we've got a little brochure that we put out and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you this video. Let's try this again. There. For those who know Madison Lolo, this is Madison Lolo. <laughs> this is Beware, it came from the sky, it came from the trees and it came from the Hey, Raji, what's got you in a nod? Didn't you see that thing, Alex? It was scary. Well, relax. Yes, ticks are nasty little bugs, but they're nothing to be afraid of. The key, my friend, is to know what ticks are and how to avoid them. First, let's take a look at a tick. Ticks are tiny. They're small enough to fit on your pinky nail. And even though they've got eight legs, they move barely faster than a snail. That's not very scary at all. If they're so slow, how do they get on you? Well, that brings us to our next topic, avoiding them. A lot of people think ticks live in trees because you sometimes find them on your head and neck. But since they can't jump or fly, that would be pretty weird. So they don't come from the sky at all? Actually, you'll find them on tall blades of grass and on the leaves of bushes. They hold their little legs out and wait for a person or animal to walk by close enough that they can grab on and hitch a ride. So, if I stay on a clear path, they won't be able to get on me at all? Exactly, kiddo. It's also helpful to wear long sleeves and pants, and to tuck your pant legs into your socks. Perfect. And it's a good idea to wear insect repellent and make sure to regularly check yourself and your friends, human or animal. Why would I need to do all that if they're not so scary? Well, the ticks themselves aren't so bad, but if one of them bites you, there's a chance it could make you sick. Gross! What do I do if I find one on me? You need two things, a grown-up and a pair of tweezers. My buddy Toby got one on him the other day and told me what his owner did. His tick looked like a little black speck connected right to the skin. Although if it had been there for a while, 
It might look swollen and grayish. Toby's owner plucked the tick out carefully, grasping it with the tweezers by the head, since that's where a tick attaches to the skin. After careful removal, she cleaned the spot with a cotton ball and stored the little bug away. Ew, store it? But I just want to throw it out. Why keep it? To give to a doctor. If the tick's still alive, it should be put in a container with a damp cotton ball. That way, they can run tests to make sure the bug's bite won't make you sick. If you ever get one and you can't remove the tick yourself, or if you get sick or get a rash, go to your doctor as soon as possible. Wow. Thanks, Alex. I'll be sure to be careful. Sure thing. Just ask your mom to help me out if I ever get one, since I have a little trouble handling tweezers. You got it, buddy. <laughs> That's a lot of other bugs. <laughs> Alright, so that was a, it was a really fun project, but it was also something that we, you know, that is educational. It does have important messages, and this is something that we've been taking out to, um, to summer camps over the last two summers. We're doing an evaluation of this, and we play it at the summer camp, and there's some um, educational materials that go with it, and a little brochure that people can take home. And we've done an evaluation of it, and it actually really resonates with kids. The, the age that we were looking at is sort of grade two, um, because um, that's the age where they're really excited and that the gross ick factor is kind of important and they like it. And uh, we've shown, um, the evaluation has shown that kids really pick up these messages and they take them home and their parents get the messages too. So that's one thing that we're doing to really try and increase awareness. We've actually translated this video in Punjabi um, and the Mandarin and French versions are, are just in final production. So uh, we've used the Punjabi version at a couple of uh, summer camps last summer, and we'll be doing that again this summer. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do with this is to spread it across the country. So we've um, got colleagues in other provinces of Canada where Lyme disease is an issue, and we're working with them to, to help them use it and use the program that we've put together with, uh, for summer kids summer camp kids um, in other provinces, and we'll be rolling that out over the next year. Anyway, thank you very much um, for the privilege of, of speaking to you this morning, and I really look forward to the discussions for the rest of the day.